Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the September Lunch and Learn here at the Harmon Museum. Our speaker today is Elizabeth Caddy Stanton. Mrs. Stanton was born in November of 1815 in Johnstown, New York, the daughter of Margaret and Daniel Caddy, one of Johnstown's most famous uh, citizens. Uh, she was educated at the Johnstown Academy and the Emma Woolard's uh, Troy Female uh, Seminary in New York. Her father was a noted lawyer and New York State Assemblyman, and she learned law indirectly through talking to her father and for listening to his conversations. She married a patent attorney, uh, Henry B. Stanton, in 19, 1840, and together they would have seven children. He was also a staunch abolitionist. While on their honeymoon in London, uh, they attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention. There she met abolitionist uh, Lucretia Mott, who like her was rather upset that at this convention against slavery, there was an exclusion of women. Uh, eight years later, in 1848, she and Mott held the now famous Women's Right Convention in Seneca Falls, New York and she authored the Declaration of Sentiment, which expands the Declaration of Independence by adding the words woman and woman uh, throughout. She met Susan B. Anthony in 1851. Their intellectual organizational partnership dominated the women's movement for over a half century. In 1862, the two of them, uh, during the Civil War, advocated for the 13th Amendment, which would end slavery. She and Anthony got somewhat controversial, more so than their usual women's rights movements, by advocating against the 14th and 15th Amendment, which gave the voting rights to black men. They wanted it extended to all people, male or female. An outstanding auditor, Stanton, after the Civil War, became one of the best known women rights activists in the country. Her speeches not only talked about women's right to vote, but also maternity, child rearing, divorce law, married women's property rights, temperance, abolition, and presidential campaigns. In the 1880s, uh, she stopped her speaking, now in her 60s, and she devoted most of her time to writing. She died on October uh, of 1902 in New York City, 18 years before the women's gained the right to vote. She came to speak in Lebanon in, on May 24th of 1878. On, over here I have an ad which appeared in the Western Star on the day before, the 23rd of May. It's rather interesting how they advertised her. Um, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, hear her able lecture on The Coming Girl. Uh, Washington Hall, Lebanon, Ohio, Friday evening, May 24th. Don't fail to hear one of America's finest speakers. Don't fail to see, quote, the handsomest old lady in America. <laughs> Don't fail to see the mother of eight, although she only had seven, um, herself over 60 years of age, she was in fact 62, uh, with a face as ruddy as in her girlhood, who travels scores of miles every day and lectures to large audiences almost every night in the week. Admission 50 cents, or no extra charge for reserved seats, plat of hall at Kinsey's Bookstore. Now, Washington Hall, which I have on this 1875 map of Lebanon, is on the lower right, was at the corner of Silver and Mechanic Street. There's now a drive-through bank for the LCMB National Bank there. Um, it was built in 1856. On its first floor was the fire department and a farm market. On its second floor was an auditorium for 500 people. In 1859, the upper floor was leased to the National Normal University, founded by Alfred Holbrook, as a chapel. When the Lebanon Opera House was built, only 101 days later it was dedicated, 
after Stanton's speech, Washington Hall's glory days were over. The new opera house had about 4,000, about 2,000 people, about four times more seating capacity. Uh, in the early 1900s, Washington Hall was renamed Memorial Hall because of its connections with veterans groups. And it was finally torn down in 1963. The 50 cent admission charge adjusted for inflation would be about $13.61 today. Kinsey's bookstore was one door south. It was operated by Oliver Hazard, um, Oliver Perry Kinsey, a professor of English and uh, history at the National Norman University. He was a graduate of that university and once worked as a janitor to help pay for his tuition. Uh, he fell in love with a former student who also became a teacher there. In 1881, he left the National Norman University and moved to Valparaiso, Indiana, where he was the co-owner of the North Indiana Normal School and Business Institute. Uh, when his friend and partner, Henry Baker Brown, had a stroke, he became the acting president of that university, now called uh, Valparaiso College. He held that position for about seven or eight years, never accepting the title of president, always acting president of the university. He died in 1931 in St. Petersburg, Florida. A couple of weeks before her speech, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's bio appeared in the Western Star. Uh, it talked about the coming girl and one of the best women in America. She's the daughter of Judge Cady of New York City and the wife of H.B. Stanton, eminent member of the New York Bar. She inherited brains and eloquence from her father and has so improved her natural advantages that she is regarded as one of the most brilliant and solid intellects in the country. She's the mother of a large family and very devoted to the interests of her children. She presents a fine personal appearance, being robust, although not stout in the gross sense, has beautiful silver gray hair, which she wears in puffs, and is a beautiful old lady in form and face. She is a philanthropist and humanitarian and feels that she is mother to all downtrodden and the oppressed. Her lectures is most sensible and highly interesting, still not telling you what it's about, and always pleases. In large cities where she is best known, the mere announcement that she will lecture is all that is needed to fill large halls. Now, 11 years before that, the Western Star had a little tiny blurb in 1867 that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony appeared before the Judiciary Committee in Albany, New York to advocate women's rights and universal suffrage. It was said that Mrs. Stanton made a lengthy and forcible speech for the occasion. Elizabeth is quite a man. <laughs> On January 15th of 1872, in the Western Star, the byline was our special correspondent in Washington, D.C. Uh, talked about uh, during the week the women's suffrage conventions was held. I had the pleasure of witnessing all these female masculines. Among them were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Victoria Woodhull. If you were with us two months ago, you know Victoria Woodhull is the uh, Queen Victoria or Mrs. Satan. We had Dr. Ruth Dan speak about her. The speech by Mrs. Stanton was able and ingenious and delivered with ease and grace. If I had seen her in a domestic circle, I would have taken her for a very venerable motherly woman. One year before her speech in Lebanon, once again, our special correspondent wrote, the ninth annual convention of the Women's Suffrage Association was held at Lincoln Hall. On the second day was opened by a speech by Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, she's a fine-looking woman, though short and fleshy. Um, her hair is perfectly white and curly. Her voice and manner is very pleasing. She was dressed in black with broad red scarf thrown carelessly around her shoulders, and she wore a very pretty headdress of blue ribbons, black race on her white hair. 
She said these annual meetings had been held for 35 years. The last nine in the city, uh, there was now but three of these, three of them left from the very first meeting, Mrs. Anthony, Mrs. Stanton, and Mrs. Gage. She did not know whether they would live to, uh, to see their hope accomplished or would have suffered the humiliation of entering the gates of heaven disenfranchised. Now, the speech of the coming girl was one of her most popular speeches. It was part of the Lyceum movement, uh, a movement of adult education uh, that was very popular in the East Coast and in the Midwest. Um, it began in 1826 in Mulberry, Massachusetts by a man named Josiah Holbrook. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's Alfred Holbrook's father, the father of the Lyceum movement. The word Lyceum actually comes from the place Aristotle lectured young Greeks in ancient Greece. Um, from 1869 to 1880, Elizabeth Cady Stanton gave the coming girl, although it was sometimes referred to as our girls and sometimes the girls of the future. It was by far her most popular lecture. Her daughter once estimated that she earned some $30,000 giving this speech. Adjusted for inflation, that is about $946,000, nearly a million dollars from this one speech. She was paid $80 to give that speech here in Lebanon, the equivalent of about $2,200. Uh, it sounds pretty good, but compared to the other ones I've seen listed, uh, it's a little bit less. Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist and escaped slave, spoke two and a half years earlier at the same um, uh, Washington Hall and was paid $100. And on November 9th of 1870, she gave the speech at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, in front of the students, faculty, and the citizens of Oxford. She had a connection to that. Her brother-in-law was then the president of Miami University, uh, Robert L. Stanton, who was also a Presbyterian minister. Uh, the coming girl is unique in Stanton's speeches as it emphasizes uh, emphasis is on the psychological, social barriers of women equality. Unlike her suffrage speeches, she avoids discussing legal and political obstacles to women's emancipation. Instead, uh, it's a deeper root of gender discrimination. In the final analysis, the coming girl advocates sweeping social changes and was in some ways more radical than Stanton's suffrage speeches. I will read to you after our speaker uh, the review she received in the Western Star for the coming girl. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great pleasure to introduce author, lecturer, social reformer, activist, chief philosopher of the women's rights and suffrage movement uh, who formulated an agenda for women's rights that guided the struggle well into the 20th century and in 1878 the handsomest old lady in America, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the coming girl. Thank you. They are the music, flower sunshine of our social life. How beautiful they make our homes, churches, schools, and festive scenes. How glad and gay they make our streets with their scarlet plumes, their bright shawls, and their tartan plaids. See how they romp and play with hoops and balls, with sleds and skates, wash their brothers' faces in the snow, and beat them in a race on yonder pond. These boys and girls are one today in school, at play, at home, never dreaming that one sex was or foreordained to clutch the stars, the other but to kiss the dust. But watch a while, and you will see these dashy, noisy, happy, healthy girls grow calm and pale and sad. And even though lodged in palace homes mid luxury and ease, with all the gorgeous trappings wealth can give, 
rich silks, bright jewels, gilded equipage, music, dancing, books, flowers, they still are listless and unsatisfied. And why? They have awakened to the fact that they belong to the subject, degraded, ostracized class. That to fulfill their man-appointed sphere, they can have no individual character, no life purpose, personal freedom, aim, or ambition. They are simply to revolve around some man, to live only for him, in him, with him, to be fed, clothed, housed, guided, and controlled by him. Today, by father or brother. Tomorrow, by husband or son. No matter how wise or mature, they are never to know the freedom and the dignity that one secures in self-dependence and self-support. Girls feel all this, though they may never utter it far more keenly than kind fathers imagine. Walking in Madison Park one day with my little boy, reading the signs hung on the trees, no dogs admitted here, he remarked. It's a good thing, mother, that dogs cannot read. It would hurt their feelings so to know that they were forbidden to walk in the parks. Yes, we said, the dogs, like girls, seem to be shut out of the green pastures of life, while both alike are ignorant of the statutes by which it is done. Bruno sleeps on his master's rug in some dark street, pining for the sunshine and the grass and the frolic through the field and forest, without knowing his degradation published in that one invidious announcement no dogs admitted here. But if he should try to enter the park, a smart rap on the nose would remind him that he was a dog and not a boy. So our young girls pine and perish for lack of freedom, for the stimulus of work and wages, something to rouse their ambition and their love of distinction. They're clothed in purple and fine linen and in their gilded cages fare sumptuously every day. But if by chance, with some new inspiration, they awake to life and go forth to claim the place in the greatest world that is birthright theirs, they find the very gates of life at the entrance to every winding path leading to the temple of knowledge and wealth and honor or fame, these same self-little signs hung out. No girls admitted here. While the dogs and the girls suffer alike the penalty of the law, the degradation of the latter is greatly aggravated by the fact that they can read the signs. And what adds to the girl's humiliation is the fact that the boy by her side reads them also and finds out that to him alone the world is free. The universe of matter and mind is his domain. He accepts the homage of multitude as his sole right and he looks with jealous eye on any girl that dares to tread upon his heels. In these artificial distinctions, boys learn their first lessons of contempt for all womankind. This should not be. Every girl should be something in and of herself, have an individual aim and purpose in life. As the boy approaches manhood, he gathers up his forces and he concentrates them on some definite work, trade, or profession, has a wish, a will, a way of his own that everybody respects. Hence, he begins life with enthusiasm, early learns the pleasure of self-dependence, growing stronger, nobler, braver, every day he lives. But alas for the girl. She leaves school with her ambition at white heat, 
per chance. She has outstripped the foremost in the sciences and languages. She has her tools ready to carve her way to distinction. She too has a will of her own and she desires the dignity and the independence of self-support. But any career for a woman is tabooed by the world and nothing that she proposes to do is acceptable to family and friends. If in spite of opposition, a woman does step outside all conventional trammels to do something that her grandmother did not do, she meets with dozens of obstacles where a man does one. Surely, the battle of life without any artificial trammels is hard enough for multitudes of young men even perish in the struggle. But for the girl who earns her bread or makes herself a name, she has all the boy has to surmount and these artificial barriers of law and custom in addition. Fathers, brothers, husbands die. Banks fail. Houses are consumed by fire. Friends prove treacherous. Creditors grasping and debtors dishonest. The skill and cunning of a girl's own brains and hands are the only friends that are ever with her. The only sure means of self-protection and support. Give your daughters then the surest of all fortunes, the full development of their own powers concentrated on some life work. The coming girl is to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. She is to hold an equal place with her brother in the world of work, in the colleges, in the state, the church, and the home. Her sphere is to no longer be bounded by the prejudice of a dead past, but by her capacity to go wherever she stand. The coming girl is to be an independent, self-supporting being, not as today a helpless victim of fashion, superstition, and absurd conventionalisms. Let us consider the reforms in her education necessary to realize the grand result. First, she is to be healthy. When there is a demand for healthy, happy, vigorous, self-reliant women, they will make their appearance. But with our feeble type of manhood, the present supply of vanity and vacuity meets their wants. Woman, as she is today, is man's handiwork. With iron shoes, steel ribbed corsets, hoops, trails, high heels, chignons, panniers, limping gait, feeble muscles, with her cultivated fears of everything seen and unseen, of snakes and spiders, mice and millers, cows and caterpillars, dogs and drunken men, firecrackers and cannon, thunder and lightning, ghosts and gentlemen, women die 10,000 deaths, when if educated to be brave and self-dependent, they would die but once. When American women begin to care more for principle than pleasing, more to be than to seem, and understand their true dignity as citizens of a republic, they will not ape foreign customs, manners, and fashions all out of joint with our theory of government. God has given you minds, dear girls. It is your duty to develop your immortal powers. Your life work is not simply to attract man or please anybody but to mold yourselves into a grand and glorious womanhood. The world will talk to you of the duties of wives and mothers and housekeepers, but all these incidental relations should ever be subordinate to the greater fact of womanhood. 
You may never be wives or mothers or housekeepers, but you will be women. Therefore, labor for the grander and more universal fact of your existence. It is a great independent truth to impress on the mind of every girl that she is an independent creative willpower made primarily for her own happiness, making self-development and self-support the highest good of the race, the end of her being. I would have girls regard themselves not as adjectives, but as nouns, not mere appendages to qualify somebody else, but independent, responsible workers in carrying forward the grand eternal plans in the redemption of mankind. I do not wish to underval undervalue domestic avocations, but the taste of women vary as much as the taste of man. And to educate all women for teachers and seamstresses, cooks, nurses and chambermaids is to make the supply in the home greater than the demand, to permanently keep down wages and degrade all these branches of labor. The coming girl is to have health. One of the first needs for every girl who is to be trained for some life work, some trade or profession is good health. As a sound body is the first step towards a sound mind, food, clothes, exercise, all the conditions of daily life are important in training girls either for high scholarship or practical work. Hence, girls, in all your gettings, get health. It is the foundation of success in every undertaking. One of the essential elements of health is freedom of thought and action, a right to individual life, opinion, ambition. It is as one of the conditions of health that the question of dress comes one of great importance. There was a time in the history of man, says Carlyle, when man was primary and his rag secondary, but times have sadly changed. Clothes now make the man. I hope we are fast coming to that period in the history of women when in her dress, her health, and freedom are to be the first considerations. As women, we are now rapidly asserting themselves in the, William, in the world of work. An entire revolution in this respect is inevitable. A physiologist need but look at the forms of all our young girls who appreciate the violence done nature in the small waist and the constrained gait and the manners of all we meet. When we remember that deep breathing has much to do with deep thinking, we see the relation between scholarship and clothes. I do not believe that it is in harmony with God's laws that any woman should move up and down the earth with her ribs lapped. And the fact the mass of American women are diseased, old before they're 30, proves that some great law is violated. I conjure every girl in the sound of my voice, if she desires a healthy, happy old age, to attend to this question of dress at once, to have her clothes hung loosely on her shoulders and not dragging down as now on her vital organs, and to have her skirts above her boot tops, that she may run up and down stairs with freedom, walk in all kinds of weather, be ready for any outdoor pleasure that may offer. A man's boot is preferable to those made for women because pressure is equal on the foot. The ankle has free play. Health is the normal condition for all women. Weakness, disease, pain, and sorrow are the results in all cases of violated law. There is nothing more absurd and untrue 
than all the talk we hear of the natural weakness and disabilities of women. Remember, girls, you have the inalienable right to be healthy and happy, and it is your duty to secure these blessings. A sound body is to the mind what a good foundation is to a house. I consider the women of this republic in beauty, intellect, moral power, and true dignity superior to any type of womanhood that the world has yet seen. And perhaps it might not be amiss in passing to say the same of our men. It is because I love my country and I believe in its free institutions that I desire to see government maintained and perpetuated as it only can be by baptizing its women into the spirit of freedom and equality. Another reason why you should observe all the laws of health is that you may be beautiful. Now, all girls desire to be so, yet they take every means to defeat their desires. I suppose you have all read the recipes for beauty in our daily newspapers. Here's one I cut from a New York paper. Beautiful women. If you would be beautiful, use Hagen's Magnolia Balm. It gives a pure, blooming complexion and restores youthful beauty. Its effects are gradual, so gradual you may never see them, natural, perfect, and it removes blotches, pimples, tan, sunburn, freckles, and redness. I wonder if it would take the redness out of the nose of our sires and sons. I so hope they get a bottle, for I hate that redness. The magnolia balm makes the skin smooth and pearly, the eye bright and clear, the cheek glow with the bloom of youth, and imparts a fresh, plump appearance to the countenance. How, pray, can an external wash make the face plump? And as to the eye, a few ideas on any subject, dear girls, will make your eyes brighter and clearer than a dozen bottles of balm. <laughs> Again, the recipe says, the magnolia will make a lady of 30 look like a girl of 16. Now, what sensible woman of 30, with all the marks of intelligence and cultivation that well-spent years must give, would desire to look like the inexperienced girl of 16. Cosmetics are worse than useless. They're positively injurious. White lead enters more or less into the compounding of all of them. Several physicians have told me of different young ladies dying in our midst with paralysis from the constant use of cosmetics and hair dyes. Now, I think a woman has as good a right as a man has to grow old, to have freckles, to tan and sunburn if she chooses. When it is only through age that one gathers wisdom and experience, why this endless struggle to seem young? I'll give you a recipe, dear girls, for nothing that will prove far more serviceable in preserving your beauty. There is nothing you can do like preserving your health by exercising regularly, breathing pure air in all your sleeping and waking hours, eating nutritious food, and bathing every day in cold water. Remember, that beauty works from within. It cannot be put on and off like a garment, and it depends far more on the culture of the intellect, the taste, sentiments, and affections of the soul, on an earnest, unselfish life purpose to leave the world better than you find it, than the color of the hair, eyes, or complexion. Be kind, noble, generous, magnanimous, be true to yourselves, to your friends, and the soft lines 
of these tender graces and noble virtues will reveal themselves in your face, in a halo of glory about the head, in a personal atmosphere of goodness and greatness that none can mistake. To make your beauty lasting when old age with wrinkles and gray hairs come and the eyes grow dim and the ears heavy, you must cultivate those immortal powers that gradually unfold and grasp the invisible as from day to day the visible ceases to absorb the soul. There is a knowledge of the truth, says Plato, that gives rest to the soul and thus saves life. But the mere capacity for this knowledge unsatisfied gives the soul not rest, but restlessness. Your life work, dear girls, is not simply to eat, drink, dress, be merry, be married, and be mothers, but to mold yourselves into a perfect womanhood. Choose then those conditions in life that will best secure a full symmetrical development. In second place, the coming girl is to be wealthy. And that is, she is to be the creator of wealth herself. I urge upon the consideration of all thinking parents and guardians and teachers the necessity of educating girls under their care to some profitable life work, some trade or profession. There cannot be too much said on the helpless condition in which a girl is left when thrown alone on the world without money, friends, skill, or place. One half of the stimulus to a girl's education is lost in the fact that she has no aim or ambition in the future. Boys may be doctors, clergymen, lawyers, editors, poets, painters, presidents, congressmen, senators, anything and everything. Be what they can. Go where they can stand. But girls must be wives and nothing more. And if they are not wives, most people consider them failures. To be independent, she must have some trade of profession beside that of wife, mother, and housekeeper. Over 50,000 in New York alone earn their daily bread by the needle, and below these are deeper depths, where dwell the daughters of vice and folly, a vast throng God only knows how many, over whom society draws the veil of forgetfulness, or before that sad problem stands hardened, or appalled. Full three-fourths, the girls before me, will be called at some period in their lives to support themselves. Shall we prepare them for the facts of life and its real emergencies, or sacrifice them to a theory? Today, perchance, your daughters rest at ease in your palace home. Tomorrow, Misfortune comes as it may to all. By some sudden turn in the wheel of fortune, your daughters, sisters, and wives may stand face to face with the stern realities of life. If in obedience to the tyrant custom you have left them unprepared for such an emergency and pressed with poverty and temptation, they are drawn down the whirlpool of vice, their destructive lies at your door. Every father has it in his power to educate his daughter in his own trade or profession, and it is his solemn duty to do it, be he doctor, lawyer, banker, jeweler, or dentist. The study of theology is peculiarly adapted to woman should her taste to draw her to that profession, as its duties are chiefly thought research, teaching, and sympathy, and its pursuit seldom leads one into the public and disagreeable walks of life. It was a woman, Elizabeth Fry, who first went down into that 
pandemonium of misery and horrors in Newgate, London. And by her eloquence wrought such changes in the character and surroundings of the unhappy criminals as to fill the wise men of her day with admiration and amazement. At one time, a great revival occurred in the Church of Wesley in his absence, when he heard that the women, as well as the men, were all talking in the assembled congregation, he hastened home to put a stop to such irregularities. But his mother told him to wait and watch. For, said she, if these women bring sinners to repentance, they are as much called of God as you are. Seeing that Wesley was under great concern of mind on this point, a friend remarked to him one day, if a cock might rouse the slumbering conscience of Peter, or an ass warn Balaam of his danger, why may not a woman reprove a man of sin? Many of our wealthy merchants, too, have daughters suffering for something to occupy their minds, yet their fathers hire clerks to do the very things for which their daughters could easily be trained. As to the profession of medicine, the fairer sex have already taken that by storm. There are medical colleges for girls in most of our great cities. Is it not better thus to use their brains and secure pecuniary independence, delegating household cares to others, than to be dependent drudges all of their days, to have perchance a few hundreds left them by husbands as long as they remain their widows? There too is the legal profession. And if the elevating, purifying influence of women is needed anywhere, it is in the courts of justice, especially in those cases involving the interest of her own sex. In Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, we see how superior the ready wit, intuition, and keen sympathy of a Portia was compared to the lumbering logic of the Antonios by her side. In portraying real wrongs before grave and reverend judges, would she be more out of place than acting imaginary ones on the stage? Would not daily talks in the lawyer's office with sensible men, with bankers and merchants and farmers, on the practical business of life, on the statute law, the land titles, the taxes, the bond mortgages, and usury for which they might receive an unprofitable talk with a dandy in the little nothings of fashionable life. To train your daughter to a good trade or profession is far better than to leave her an unhappy dependent or a fortune without the necessary knowledge to take care of it every thinking man must see how entirely a woman's virtue and dignity are involved in her pecuniary independence. Encourage your daughters, your sisters, your wives to enter all into honest, profitable employments. When women are independent and self-supporting, fewer will enter the marriage relation with the present gross conceptions of its rights and duties, for the coming girl is to be wise as well as healthy and self-supporting. In the higher civilization now dawning upon us, the love element of pure, refined women guided and controlled by conscience, science, and religion will find higher pure outlets for its forces, giving us that glorious period when old maids will be honored and revered. The world has always had its Marys as well as its Marthas, women who prefer to sit at the feet of wisdom, to learn science and philosophy rather than to be busy housewives. 
Marriage has thus far been based wholly on the man idea, a condition of subjugation for women. The Methodist Church has taken the initiative step to the higher idea. I understand that by an act in their ecclesi ecclesiastical councils, they have dropped the word obey from their marriage ceremony. So, until all other sects follow this example, I hope all you girls will insist on being married by the Methodist ceremony and clergyman. Now, I think that all these reverend gentlemen who insist on the word obey in the marriage service should be impeached in the Supreme Court of the United States for a clear violation of the 13th Amendment to the Federal Constitution, which says, there shall be no slavery or involuntary servitude in the United States. An old German proverb says that every girl is born into the world with a stone on her head. This is just as true now as the day it was first uttered. Your creeds, codes, conventionalisms have indeed fallen with crushing weight on the head of woman in all ages. But nature is mightier than law and custom. And in spite of the stone on her head, behold her today, close upon the heels of man in the whole world of thought, in art, in science, in literature, and government. Many have risen up in spite of the stone on their heads and walked forward as easily as did Samson into the gates of the city. Educate the world into higher thoughts and affections. Children of the brain are more needed for the ushering in of a higher civilization than those of the flesh alone. That beautiful myth of the goddess Minerva springing from the brain of her father, fully armed and equipped for the battle of life, has a deeper significance than the world dreams of today. <laughs> Six days after uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton delivered that speech here in Lebanon, the Western Star reviewed it uh, in a short little three paragraph uh, article. Mrs. Stanton lectured in Lebanon on last Friday night. She said the coming girl would not powder her face nor hang her clothes on her hips, nor impede the circulation of her blood by flowing her stockings in places with garters. Although the paper did not actually spell out garters, it had G, big blank, S. Uh, <laughs> nor squeeze her uh, ribs so uh, with tight corsets. But Caddy didn't say anything about the coming girl would not let boys squeeze her ribs. The coming girl is never faint. She is not to be delicate, uh, but on the contrary, strong and strong-minded. She is to learn a profession or trade, and she is to reach the acme of female perfection by getting the ballot in her hand. We know a great many families who would like, there have girls like this coming girl so described to be, barring the latter named attributes, which I believe is the right to vote. Um, a little over a year ago, in August of uh, 2020, uh, the Women's Rights Pioneer Monument was dedicated and unveiled at New York Central Park on the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. The sculpture depicts Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth engaged in animated discussion. In the park's 166 year history, it is the first sculpture of any 
woman who actually existed. Uh, the only other female sculpture in New York City's 843 acres is Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> I would like to uh, thank um, Gail Rose, the um, uh, Vice President of the Warren County Historical Society, for uh, arranging for Mrs. Stanton to be here. Without her assistance, I don't think we'd have a speaker today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Gail for helping Mrs. Uh, Stanton edit her speech. Her speech is about twice as long as what you just heard. Uh, and you can find it on the internet by simply uh, searching uh, The Coming Girl. Yes. Could you remind us again what year she gave this? This was on May 24th, 1878. So we are talking uh, 22, 143 years ago. She gave that speech, so much of which is still relevant today. Um, and so much is still uh, advisable to listen to. Yes? Who would have uh, been uh, there at the speech? Would it have been just men or women or children? Well, it was open to all. I would imagine there would have been uh, men and women there. Um, I would hope, I mean, uh, Durbin Ward, the owner of Glendara, was still, uh, still alive. Um, and of course, Alfred Holbrook probably was there. Um, I'm assuming this, it, you know, the, the Lyceum movement which brought that was uh, more or less under the universities uh, with Kinsey being the, the man who booked this and this being a Lyceum type thing, Holbrook would have been involved in that. So I would imagine many of the uh, the intellectual leaders, if you will, of Lebanon through the national normal would be there, both male and female. Does anybody else have any other questions for myself or Mrs. Stanton? Thank you once again. Yes. Once women get the vote, how long do you think it'll be before we have a woman for president? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that question. I wish I did too. I was, uh, I did particularly like that section of her speech when she talked about women in the law profession and influencing the courts, um, particularly in issues concerning women. And um, I thought that rang rel relatively true to us. Frankly, I thought perhaps we would have one a couple of elections ago. But, so all I can say to you is, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Keep speaking. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Mrs. Stanton was married. Did she outlive her husband? Yes, her husband died in the, I think it was 1887. So she outlived her husband by uh, 15 years. She had some independence then. Yeah. She was a very fortunate woman in that she grew up in a home where her father, who was a lawyer, welcomed her into his offices, let her overhear legal conversations, engaged her in those conversations, and then she married a man who was also very progressive for his time. You know, he was generally known most for being an abolitionist, and she helped him with that. But he also encouraged her to follow through on her passions, and he supported her in her speaking, even though they had seven children along the way. Well, thank you folks for joining us. We got one more oh, we have one more question, yes. Was she also uh, in the temperance movement? Was she also part of the I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I listed a number of things she was involved in. I don't know if temperance was in that list or not. Um. I don't recall reading much about her involved in that particular one. She was very active um, in the abolitionist movement. 
And through that, as John had indicated earlier, she met up with some other women internationally who were interested in promoting women um, into a higher role in society. So yep. I'm not sure that she... I, I found it. Oh. Uh, uh, maternity, child rearing, divorce law, married women's property rights, temperance, oh, okay. abolition, and presidential campaigns. She was one busy lady. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, hope to see you next month uh, when we will be talking about Halloween and ways it's been celebrated for over 100 years now. Uh, please take advantage of the discount at the, at the gift shop, and also please explore the museum. Uh, the Armstrong Gallery is right over this way if you just want to walk through that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Great job. Thank you.